all of your colleagues, you're very welcome and thank you for attending. Um, I suppose we felt as a committee it was important that your appearance would be at some of the, the front end of our works. Yeah, uh, no just, be, just before we, um, we commence with your opening statement, Minister, just in relation to a uh, note on privilege, I want to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 1721 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue so to do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him or her or it identifiable. The opening statement submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Uh, Minister Kelly, uh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, your opening statement has been circulated um, and it will, will be published if that's okay with you. Yes. Um, and in your opening comments, you can address the statement in full or as you see. Yeah, I might go through the statement in full if it's okay, Chair, because there's so much in it and it might help. I might emphasise some points as I go along and I might also uh, come back to uh, some issues later on if that's okay. Uh, firstly, thanks for the invitation uh, to address uh, the committee. Uh, secondly, um, as you're aware, Chair, because there was some comment, I was unable to attend here on Tuesday simply by the fact that I had a cabinet meeting, so um, I think uh, some people um, may have I missed that, but uh, it was obvious I couldn't attend with a, with a cabinet meeting, but I was glad to be here today at your second sitting. So thanks for the invitation um, and for inviting myself and my officials uh, to uh, today's proceedings. And I want to congratulate you on your role, uh, Chairperson and on the committee, uh, for uh, its initiation and set up. Uh, and while the time frame is very short um, and has a huge amount of work to do, I genuinely uh, wish this committee well because I think it's a good initiative. I think it can achieve things. And I'm going to be very open with this committee today as regards solutions um, uh, later on. Um, and be positive because I think we have to be positive. Um, so I want to introduce my, the, my colleagues who are with me, uh, Barbara Niengesa, who is the Assistant Secretary for the Housing Section, uh, on my right. Um, and further to her is uh, Barry Quinlan, who is the Principal Officer in the Housing Policy Area. Uh, to my left is Niall Cusson, who is the Principal Planning Advisor, and to his left is uh, Brian Kenny, who is the Principal in Homelessness in the Housing uh, Inclusion uh, Section of my department. Um, housing matters rightly have been the focus of serious and considerable media commentary in recent times, usually based either explicitly or implicitly on a simple supply and demand model. In a simple model, supplier demand adjusts and prices respond accordingly. However, and this is a key point I think, uh, housing is not a normally functioning market, Chairman, at the moment, and that is the real cusp of the issue. It is not a normal functioning market. I know, I know that while there are children and families in emergency accommodation, it will remain the headline story in terms of housing, and I understand that, and I accept that. Uh, but it's important uh, to recognise that this uh, is a symptom of much deeper supply issues and can only be dealt with through increasing supply of social, private and rental properties. In the meantime, we must continue to strive to help these families and I consider rapid build is the best immediate answer along with greater investment in social housing, increasing housing supports and services and continuing to improve services for families in difficulties. Every player, state body or otherwise, has a part to play in solving this housing problem. And Chairman, there's a multiplicity of different departments, agencies, outside agencies, private bodies, uh, and many more, local authorities, etc., who all have a role. It is really um, a, a huge intertwined web of various different organisations and issues uh, that have to solve this problem. Any long-term solution needs the entire housing system pulling in the same direction to a common goal, 
And this committee is uh, moving in the right direction in terms of getting cross-party approach uh, to repairing the broken system. What I'm going to try and set out is what I believe are the key system systemic uh, weaknesses uh, and questions we need to answer and meaningful recommendations for what needs to be done into the future. The first point I'd like to make is that when we're discussing housing, we need to separate out the issues in order to generate real and true learnings. There are issues all over the sector, in private housing, social housing, uh, private rented sector, and homelessness. Uh, those who are caught in excessive mortgage debt, working couples who can't get mortgages, etc. All of these issues collectively all interact and impact on each other. Um, but I support the committee's efforts to discuss them individually, Chair, but they are all interconnected. It's a critical point. These are all interconnected and can't be separated out um, piecemeal. Uh, this is because there is no one cure-all to the housing situation. Uh, the remedies to the problems are not all to be found within my department, and that is not to uh, say that uh, you know, we don't have a massive role. Of course we have a massive role, the Department of the Environment. But certainly all the levers aren't in the Department of the Environment. There are many pieces of this conundrum that need to be aligned in order for it to be solved. But they're all not within my department. Issues around construction input costs is one example. How building materials are taxed, or indeed the price of land, none of which are to uh, the lever of the Department of the Environment. We need to be really creative from formulating solutions, and I would encourage the committee to carry out its work in that vein. Uh, despite uh, differing political ideologies, our end goal is the same. More, better, affordable homes with adequate infrastructure to service the demand and an end to the boom-bust housing cycle. We, the state, the elected members and non-elected officials need to come up with bold and innovative solutions and bring all the stakeholders in both the private and public sphere with us. Simple fact is that our construction industry is not building enough houses to meet the needs of our people. New supply is very low, with 12,300 houses completed last year, nearly half of those one off, and some finishing out from the overhang of incomplete uh, construction. This is a significant and real uh, number, and I believe it's not going to move very quickly. The numbers being delivered are about half of what is estimated new supply required by our country with its growing population and growing economy. With the addition of new private supply so low, we really have to reassess the scale of the role of the state in the provision of housing broadly. Social housing in Ireland makes up 9% of households, as compared to 15% in France, 22% in Germany, and 31% in the Netherlands, and 20% in the UK. One of the effects on this is that there is considerable reliance on the private rented sector for the provision of social housing in Ireland. It must be made clear that the share of social housing as a percentage of all households will increase substantially under the new social housing strategy. The central question for the next government is, how much of our housing problem can and should the state solve? The state has traditionally supplied approximately 10% of homes through social housing for those who can't afford their own. It's a very real question. If that dynamic is to change dramatically as a result of inactivity from the construction sector, then there are significant consequences for our overall budgetary programme. Increased funding for housing has to come from elsewhere, whether from health, education, etc. I won't talk about any other topical issues at the moment. So, <coughs> Chair, it is time for big ideas <coughs> and considerations. Between NAMA, the social housing strategy, and the mixed-use developments that local authorities like DCC are pioneering, there will be major state intervention in the supply of housing. But I believe a balance is necessary, and I believe in that intervention. But also in the short term, the state is going to ha absolutely have to increase its role in the provision of housing, and it must be supported in doing so. At local authority level, elected members need to ensure better use of limited land supply in urban areas and embrace higher densities and potentially high-rise living in cities. We need to future-proof our housing supply and ensure that our ageing population, and we are all included in that cohort, 
is catered for and that the system is sufficiently flexible to deal with increasing demand. As collectively as politicians, we need to ask ourselves whether we're doing all we can to ensure that housing projects are supported and promoted at all levels of the planning and development process. And I extend that uh, political process beyond uh, these houses, down to local authority level, who have a key role in this, and which I think we need to come back to during our discussions. For, it, for example, it is contradictory to have politicians, and I say this genuinely, of all persuasions and none, calling for urgent action to deal with areas where there are housing shortages, and then objecting to the very housing projects needed, either on an individual basis, or on a multiplied basis, or whatever. Politicians of all political persuasions, and none, need to address some of the negative associations that go with social housing development if we are to get a speedier resolution to our housing crisis. There are many objectors to social housing developments. Even when they are, where they are being carried out by the Peter McVeary Trust, the Simon Community, or more recently in Beaumont here in Dublin. DCC recently provided my department with a list of 16 projects last year, all that have been met with objections. There is no question in my mind but that NIMBYism and an incorrect negative perception of social housing leads to object objections which delay local authorities in their work. Another matter we also need to face up to the cold hard truth of is that with the cost of constructing a new home now being significantly more than second-hand prices in most parts of the country, we are going to have to improve the economics for the private market to supply badly needed uh, additional homes. The sums don't add up. That's the bottom line. If it's not, um, if it's not uh, beneficial for people to build houses, they will not build them. If they can't make a, a modest profit at least. When you compare these costs, the new affordability dynamic that is created by the central bank rules, which in general I support, it shows that many potential builders are waiting and continuously waiting and waiting before they build. That is just simply a fact. My department has been to the fore in applying a wide range of measures to bring the costs of constructing homes more within reach of what ordinary people and families can afford to pay. But it appears that these measures may not be enough and that we must go further. Remember earlier on I spoke about levers. Uh, we addressed issues within our own domain. But simply put, many of the issues in relation to costs are not within the domain of the Department of the Environment. Reductions in local authority development contributions, a streamlining of Part 5 social housing requirements, more consistent application of minimum apartment standards, and recently a targeted development contribution rebate scheme have together reduced input costs by anything from 20 to 40,000, depending on whether apartments or houses are being constructed. Probably need, well, it's not probably, we need to go further. The next government is going to have to grapple with the basic economics of housing on the supply side in this country if it wants to see a significant uplift in the activity by the private sector. And that is one of the key messages I want to get across here today. Recent history should demonstrate to us the danger of over-reliance on the private market, but we do need to decide what exactly is the appropriate mix of private and public housing. The Housing Actions Report, which I published uh, a fortnight ago, which I take it everyone here has had a chance to have a look at, um, provides further information on 31 major actions taken across the housing spectrum. By the way, if anyone hasn't, we have copies here if people want them. 31 major actions taken across the housing spectrum in the past 21 months to increase the supply of housing, including social housing. Every one of these actions is important and will have a positive impact in dealing with the problem. But evidently, and obviously, we must go further. Some are calling for a relaxation of central bank lending rules as the answer. But what will that result in? It clears the way to go back to the failures of the past, the failures we all know about. When families ended up paying half a million for a family home and then worried for 30 years afterwards how they were going to pay for it, or if they were going to pay for it. Surely if two people on the average industrial wage of 32,000 can afford something, say, around 200,000, isn't that the type of house built to proper standards and regulations in decent locations we should be aiming to provide with every strand of public policy? As a nation, we must also have a serious think about our attitude to renting. 
If we can reform the rental market to make it more secure and attractive to tenants, I believe it can become a real long-term option for future generations. But the sector needs further reform. The rental market in Ireland has doubled between 20, 2006 and 2011 to about 320,000 households, around 20% of total Irish households. In Dublin, rents are now back to 2007 peak boom time levels. The measures I put in place last November, November will bring much needed stability to the sector. But to really offer a secure, stable and attractive housing option, the rental sector needs more supply with the associated competition that brings to the market. If we, the democratically elected parliamentarians, wish to see a situation where more people get access to the homes they deserve and at prices or rent they can afford and locations they desire, I believe we are going to have to go further and address the following questions. What is an affordable price rent for a home? What exactly is the state's future role in housing provision? How do we reduce input costs, including direct and indirect tax take, which is currently, currently more than a third of the cost of delivering a new home? Is the negative perception of social housing developments leading to unfounded objections causing huge delays? I think we all know the answer to that. Do the local authorities and approved housing bodies have the capacity to build sufficiently? How do we guarantee that any reductions by the state in these input costs will actually be passed on to the household by developers? Where will the money come from to invest in the infrastructure needed to prepare land for development? And how do we make land available over many years at fair prices? Addressing these real issues raises politically and socially important questions. It also gets to the core of our problems. And many of them are very sensitive questions, by the way. We're going to have to face up to the fact that if we truly believe that people's incomes, rather than the demands of the market, should determine housing costs, that the following must happen. The state should set real housing output targets and set out the wide-ranging time-bound actions required to meet that objective. Not just for social housing, which I have done, but for housing in general. Targets for big reductions in housing construction costs are going to have to be set and delivered on by all stakeholders, not just uh, the state, but developers and suppliers as well. Maybe the state could lead. Local authorities need to be encouraged and incentivized to invest for the future in preparing housing lands for development. And a grown-up conversation on Article 43 of the Constitution to achieve a better balance between the rights of individuals as property owners with the wider social, including housing needs, of society. Later on uh, in the uh, day, uh, Chairperson, I have a number of other recommendations which I'd like to share to the, House, but, uh, to the Committee, but that's initial four. With regard to social housing, this is arguably the one part of the housing system that is actually turning a corner. The last summary of social housing assessments in 2013 showed that there were almost 90,000 households on local authority waiting lists at that date. In April last year, as part of the Social Housing Strategy 2020, I announced over 1.5 billion in funding allocations in respect of social housing to be provided by all local authorities for the period out to 2017 via a combination of building, buying and leasing schemes uh, to meet the housing needs of 25% 25, 25 of the housing list. And as you all know, in this document, across the country, is listed all the various different projects. Over 680 million has now been allocated for over 3,900 social housing new bills, turnkey developments and acquisitions from the capital budget alone. That's just the capital budget. It doesn't include AHPs or other uh, areas. So I want to see local authorities advance these projects as quickly and as soon as possible, and I've assured them that funding is available to fully support their efforts in this regard. No issues. In all, over 13,000 sets of keys uh, have been delivered to people and families in 2015, the first full year of imp implementation of the strategy. This represents an 86% increase in unit delivery above 2014. This is all independently verified by the other document, which I'm sure you've all uh, read, which is Social Housing Output, uh, which is a document that is done uh, through the Housing Agency. Um, it was achieved in a very difficult operating environment and represents a good start to the implementation of the strategy. I'm not saying anything else. All I'm saying is it's a good start. I expect in the region, Chair, of 17,000 social housing keys to be delivered this year. 
Local authorities have been geared up again to deliver at scale. Uh, well in excess of 450 staff have been allocated to local authorities. That may takes time and the announcements I made will be delivered in the years ahead. That's why this document is called Laying the Foundations. We have to be realistic. Houses don't appear overnight. So I would argue that investment in and delivery of social housing isn't the issue. If we can get the housing market functioning appropriately again, I think that is the key issue. Almost three billion and it's not the main issue anyway. Almost three billion in capital funding will be provided to deliver social housing under the capital plan up to twenty twenty one, as well as under fund, other funding models such as the PPP. PPPs. The real issue is supply for the other elements of the market, and particularly in relation to supply of housing that is intrinsically affordable for your average or lower income household. This is the cohort, Chair, that I am most concerned about. Those who are to the pen of their collar, paying rent, while in some instances trying to save for a deposit. It's a catch-22 situation. We all know that. Without the required supply of housing coming on stream to take the heat out of the rental market and indeed the supply of homes at an affordable price, we are simply storing up problems for the future. In the short to medium term, the focus needs to be on the residential construction sector and boosting supply. It is taking time to recover from the economic downturn and consequently supply from that sector is lagging significantly behind demand. As I said earlier, private market housing is currently delivering circa 50% of the estimated annual requirements of 25,000 dwellings nationally. Lack of supply is having an adverse effect on the rental market. And along with causing all the problems I've alluded to, will also impact on our competitiveness. We have the housing system we have, colleagues, because of political and social choices made in the past. To a certain extent, insofar as the financial crisis is concerned and its impact on the housing sector, to be fair, some of those choices were probably made for us to some, to some percentage. During my 21 months in office, probably a little bit longer now, um, I use the powers or whatever is available to me, not necessarily to be able to solve the problem, because I think that was virtually impossible, but to lay the foundations for a long-term and sustainable solution to this problem. And I believe that the 31 major actions taken in the past 21 months will have a substantial impact. But I need to stress that I and this team here could only directly take the necessary actions which, which fell within my areas of responsibility. This is a key point for this committee and the incoming government when it asks itself about decisions should, we should be taking now to put our housing system, and I mean all elements of the spectrum, back on a sustainable footing. To truly crack this nut, my successor, uh, our successor, or whoever is there's going to be a housing minister or a minister of the environment, who knows, needs to be able to exert sufficient influence over all the levers that will bring us to that end, including certain elements of taxation and the powers to introduce changes that will really impact on the viability of development for the builder and ensure that any reduction in input costs is passed on to the homeowner so that we have affordable homes in the true sense of the word. I've heard a lot of talk, and it might be a recommendation to come from this committee that we should have a Minister for Housing. In principle, I have no objection to it. It may be a good idea, but let me just say this quite clearly here. Appointing a Minister for Housing with the title and just taking the functions from the Department of Environment is an absolute waste of time. We have a Minister for the Environment or whatever role that will have. But unless you take sections from the Department of Finance, Department of Public Expenditure, Department of Social Protection, and their SA to other agencies, and wrap all them into that, set, into that ministry, well then, they're certainly going to be just left in the same position as myself and Minister Coffey were left in after the last 21 months. And we have a huge role to play, I admit that. But as part of the overall pie, I think it's just one point I wanted to make to you. If we're going to increase the supply of homes to the extent needed, we need to take a comprehensive action-based approach that is broad in scope and recognises all tenures. An approach that boosts supply, one that helps tenants as well as homeowners, and one which recognises that alongside new homes, we really do need to address the issue of how zoned land is made available for development so that we make the very best 
of existing infrastructure, investment, lands and buildings. We also really do need to have a grown-up conversation about Article 43 of the Constitution and getting the balance right between the rights of the individual as regards property rights and the common good. Two specific items that were directly affected by this were the vacant site levy and protection of a tenancy during the sale of a property. Let me put that straight on the record. On the vacant site levy, while I am delighted that it is now enshrined in our laws, it is something that I absolutely believe in. My original proposal, working with Minister Coffey, was to have it at 6 to 7 percent of the market value of the land and for it to be introduced next year, or even later on this year. To ensure it is safe from a constitutional challenge, that provision was amended. Similarly, when it came to residential tenancies legislation, the Constitution acted as a barrier against protecting tenancies in cases where the property is sold. And I say this, colleagues, and I know there's been lots of commentary on this. I say this not to attribute any blame to the Constitution, but for this committee, I need to be open and honest about the situation as I faced it. And also for the record, and this is something because there was commentary on this, I never, ever, ever suggested that the matter of compulsory purchase of land for housing was not an option for local authorities. We might discuss that later. But it's not a panacea. There are issues with that as well. And it can go on for years and years and years. The key question for you is, what is the appropriate role for the state in all of this? Some might say we should go back to the massive public house building projects because the house building sector will never deliver. I think that's a deeply flawed approach that accepts failure. Yes, we need a vibrant public housing sector, but do we seriously think nationalising all housing provision in the state is the answer? Have any of us here today any sense of the budgetary implications that would pose and the schools or hospitals we would not be able to build if we diverted a huge level of exchequer resources into housing to the detriment of other needy sectors? We have this famous fiscal space. I believe a serious amount of that needs to go into housing. But we have also, and everyone inside in this room, will be arguing for a section of that pie to be going in other sectors as well. So we need to have a mix. That's my point. Do any of us here really believe that the answer to our broken housing system is the recreation of swaths of vast local authority states where in some cases in the past have taken billions, billions of euros to regenerate? Would it not be better to fix our broken housing market, uh, bring about social housing in con a, 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 with that, rather than dancing around the edges and pointing out the weaknesses but without the political bravery to fix them once and for all? I believe that housing economics in this country to be an eminently fixable problem if the collective will is there by us as parliamentarians and all the other stakeholders. It cannot be beyond our ability to deliver housing at a cost that ordinary people and average incomes can afford to rent or buy. I certainly believe it's possible and I want to do everything to deliver that. In addition, in an ideal world chair, public policy would not only espouse but deliver a plan-led supply of land for housing acquire it at reasonable cost if necessary, and then prepare it with the necessary infrastructure before making it available for public and private housing development in sustainable communities, capturing the uplift in value arising from zoning and servicing of land, and paying for the infrastructure through that process, which we might describe, describe as active land management. Another topic I believe we should get back to. I might just add, before I conclude, having debated this issue during the election, I did not seek a quick answer or silver bullet in any political manifesto that would resolve uh, this overnight. I didn't see one. I didn't seek one. You heard from local authorities on Tuesday, uh, I, um, I, I, I didn't see their contribution but I went back over it, that there is a lag time of about two and a half years when it comes to housing development and that we need to buy and lease in the meantime. There is quite an amount of information in the documents, social housing output and laying the foundations, both of which I've shown to you, which I'm sure the committee members, members have had time to study. We can collectively, I believe, create the ideal scenario and perhaps, Chair, and I wish you the best, the 32nd doll through this committee might just grasp that opportunity. And that this might be the springboard and take the lesson learned over the past few years and decade and develop a national strategy for the delivering of all housing in Ireland that addresses all types, tenures and sectors and above all the needs of our citizens. And the last uh, thing I want to say, uh, Chair, 
Um, in relation to my contributions here, I want to be positive. I want to be solution-based, working with everyone. The election is over. Uh, this is, and I say this, in my time in the department, I know we spoke about water yesterday, but in my time in the department, this took up 90% of my time because it is the most pressing issue. Um, I believe collectively, working together, we certainly can find um, uh, uh, some uh, solutions. Uh, and I would like, uh, at some point later on, uh, to, I've put forward four recommendations. I would like to put forward more based on the collective experience of this team over the last uh, number of years. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you for your, for your opening statement. Just before we take specific questions, I'd like to ask you just one general question. And it arose, I suppose, having listened to your presentation here this morning and previously your uh, contribution in the Dáil on the issue of housing. Um, and I sense, and I, I'm not making a political point here, at certain times you indicate... You never do that. Uh, I, I sense uh, uh, a certain frustration, and you touched on if there were to be a Minister for Housing, uh, the role that that Minister would have to be effective. Specifically, what functions do you, do you feel um, other, other than that that Minister would need uh, to be something different than what happens in the Department of the Environment. What specific functions to make that? And the other point you might elaborate a little further on, because you also, uh, I suppose you did elaborate a bit, is in relation to the constitutional challenges that you, you met. Yeah, okay. Um, the, uh, in relation to, uh, like I have no issue with a, a future Minister of Housing. It may very well be a good idea. I'm open to it. But like, uh, I, you know, I'm being frank and honest. I genuinely be totally frank and honest with you here. Like, if you want a Minister for Housing who's going to be the, you know, the person who is going to be the, um, the driver of all of this and the czar at the top of it, they need to have control of all the levers. Or they need to be the person who's answerable for all the levers at the very least. Um, during the last uh, couple of years, myself and Minister Paddy Coffey certainly didn't have access to all the levers. Uh, and I'll say this out straight. I mean, if you're going to have a Minister, they're going to have to have control over certain taxation measures. Now, let's be frank about this. Is any government going to take away those powers of a Minister for Finance? I, I'll absolutely be amazed, Chair, if that happens. I'll absolutely be amazed if that will be allowed to happen. Right? That's the first point. Because how are you going to bring down... We speak about this over, is it 38% of, of the cost of building a house is, goes to the state. That has to be addressed. But that's the Department of Finance. It's not the Department of Environment. So the person who's going to be in charge has to actually have that area. When it comes to uh, areas of, uh, of public expenditure, so whoever is the future minister as regards allocating funding, etc., you know, that pie that I spoke about earlier on, and you'll have the pie for, you'll have the component for education and healthcare and everything else. If that pie wants to get bigger, and by the way, I have to say this, I got great cooperation from uh, Brendan Howland of getting four billion was, this, was I mean, I had an incredibly difficult time, was a huge amount to get. But into the future, again, that decision, and I'll bet you again, my bottom dollar, that that ain't going to be handed over either. Social protection uh, in relation to the whole area of rent, uh, rent supplement, um, the lever there, um, and there's many, I, I'm very interested by the contribution of the CCMA in relation to that last uh, Tuesday as well, um, in relation to that lever. The whole role of NAMA, who is responsibility there, what is the future of NAMA, should it be turned into a housing agency? Uh, um, I know many people have issues with NAMA, but it's, it's simply a fact that they have a role in relation to housing into the future because of the nature of what they are. The whole uh, issue in relation to uh, how NAMA was set up, um, the fact is that they have a commercial mandate. Uh, unless that is changed, um, they can certainly act in, a certain, in other ways. That's just reality. We have to accept that or change it. If we change it, there are issues in relation to on balance sheet with Europe, possibly. Um, and there are a number of other areas. So what I'm saying here, um, uh, uh, Chairman, is quite simply is that, like, I believe it would be tokenistic to appoint a Minister for Housing unless them three or four, which I just addressed, and dare I say it, there are others, uh, are all wrapped into that ministry. And I can't, and I, you know, I just can't see 
you could see some sort of relationship being built with the Department of Finance. But at the end of the day, if there's a Minister for Finance who's controlling this uh, sector or those decisions, well then the Minister for Housing isn't truly a full, um, uh, in full control of it. In relation to uh, the Constitution, uh, um, I have the privilege currently, for another few days anyway, of sitting at the Cabinet. Um, and when you, you know, you have to act at all times in accordance with the law and the you know, obviously, we, we take advice from the Attorney General's office. Uh, and you can't uh, produce legislation um, that is in contrary to the, to the Constitution. You've sat there. You know that. Um, so you've got to work within the environs of that and keep it between the ditches, so to speak. Um, and I found that, and, you know, there will be debate. I mean, I saw the articles in the paper. I saw the Master of the High Court make his comments. Um, but he's not sitting at the cabinet. I'm sorry. I have to take what I'm sitting. You have to take the advice you're given, and I respect the advice. Uh, and the advice is from the highest uh, office, legal office, that's, um, that that uh, supports the government. So when it comes to the vacant site levy, I believe fundamentally we have to address the issue of hoarding land, right? Because basically it's just been left there. Like the volume of sites between the two canals in this city that are going underdeveloped is incredible, right? Uh, and I wanted to instigate certain powers in relation to local authorities to be able to address that. Um, uh, and I wanted to do it fairly quickly. But because of the constitutional uh, issue and the advice I got, I had to push it out. And for proportionality reasons, I had to drop the percentage. A similar issues when it came to addressing uh, rental issues as regards um, as regards a number of areas in relation to uh, rent. So, for instance, we're all well aware of the um, issues in relation to vulture funds. And um, I met with the people from Terrellstown. In fairness, uh, I, you know, I was asked to do so, and I was glad to do so. Very decent people. Um, but again, if you were going to bring in legislation which is going to uh, prevent the sale, um, you know, from, from a constitutional point of view, uh, certainly there were questions. There were also issues in relation to uh, the rental sector and other areas as well. So that's just fact. You've got to take the advice. So I, I'm just throwing it out there because everything has to be out there. I mean, I believe in the rights of property rights, but we have to look at, is the balance there? Maybe, maybe we can't change it. Maybe we shouldn't change it, but maybe we should. And certainly I believe we need to talk about it. Uh, and that's why I'm putting that out there, uh, Chair. Fair enough? Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Okay, uh, members, first member presenting for a question, Deputy uh, Coppinger. Thanks, Chair. Um, Minister, just firstly to say that you're not to blame for the housing crisis, you know. Um, sometimes there's a tendency for, t for you to get very defensive, but you are answerable for the last number of years of... All right, I'm in the new fund space for the next week, you're all good. Okay, of your party <laughs> being in power and you in particular being in this ministry. So the first question I, I have is, why are the local authority housing targets so low in the first place? Um, in Social Housing 2020, you have a target of 35,000 new units for the, for, from 2015 to 2020. But only 11,200 are going to be new social housing units to be built or required by councils or housing associations. So, if you break that down, there's 100,000 families on the housing list, roughly. So only one in 10 would be catered for by the acquisition or building of a social housing unit based on those targets. Um, the rest of the 35,000 new units was to be 11,000 leases, 2,300 refurbishments of voids, and then 9,000 units bought or leased under the Part 5. But that's dependent on the private sector building for those to be acquired. So you can see how, with a continuation of this policy, the social housing lists are never going to be impacted in, in the way that's needed. Um, the other issue I, I, I have is looking through your, your document. Um, why are the targets proportionally lowest in the worst affected areas of homelessness? Um, if you take Dublin, and Dublin isn't the only place, but it is at the epicentre of this particular tsunami. If you take the four Dublin local authorities, 
There's 22,000 on Dublin City Council's housing list in December. Um, but what you're talking about in laying the foundations would only impact on 21% of the list. In the case of Fingal, it will be 23%. So all of the other areas have higher outcomes. So you can see how the targeted intervention in the worst affected areas just isn't happening. Um, the other question is on the breakdown of actual social housing. You, you say in your speech that the share of social housing as a percentage of households will increase significantly under your strategy. But in the first year of your strategy, there was only a maximum net increase of 268 genuinely new social housing units across all the schemes last year. Um, and I'll break that down. Out of 13,375 new units, you refer to this on page four of your statement, the 13,000 sets of keys units. Okay, so out of that, 2,696 are renovated voids and 125 regenerated. 1,096 are local authorities acquiring second-hand homes. 64 are new local authority completions, including from part five developers and 401 are built or bought by housing associations. So out of all of that, 33,000, only 1,561 are actually new permanent social housing units by local authorities or housing agencies. 1,500. Um, 8,933 units will be rented or leased from landlords or developers. Like, Minister, the, the, the complete reliance on the private sector uh, would you admit now, at least, that you, when you're leaving the post, that that was an error? And the other question is, why is capital spend so low? Um, you keep talking in the doll about the money that's been thrown at this. The money that's been thrown at this is lower. It's a third of what it was in 2008. So, you know, we have a housing crisis and the money has to increase. Um, 11 billion has been taken out of housing since the recession began. It has to be put back in if we're going to solve the housing crisis. Um, yeah, I'll just move on. You mentioned in your speech that these people, you were probably referring to people on the left, who say we need loads of more money for social housing, the money has to come from somewhere else. You say, uh, take, is it going to come from health or education? No, Minister, it's not. It could come from NAMA. NAMA have three billion in their own cash reserves at the moment. Some, and which we'll have NAMA in here, so I don't want to focus on NAMA, but I'm just saying that there is money there, that the government could have ordered NAMA at any time to change their remit. You could also look at taxing wealth in this country. That's the other place. It, the fiscal space you talk about can't resolve the housing crisis or the other health and education. It's too small. So you need to get more wealth and use it for the vast majority in society. But you haven't been willing to do that. Um, you, just quickly as well, you mentioned the percentage of social housing in Ireland being always very low. But in the 60s, it was almost 20%. So it wasn't always low. Just on the private rented sector, Minister, you've mentioned this today and in the doll about you being powerless in the face of the Constitution to keep people in their homes. I think people should, that, that legislate, that legal advice you got, I assume from the Attorney General, saying that people couldn't be kept in their homes if a property's been sold, that should be published because it's, it's been disputed by others. Um, you mentioned Edmund Honahan and hopefully he will be brought in. We're meant to have a session on legal issues that are needed um, to resolve the housing issue. But can I just mention as well, Minister, you didn't enact most of the claimed improvements in the Residential Tenancies Bill yet. M m most of it hasn't been enacted. Well, for example, the statutory declaration that landlords need to give if they're going to sell a property hasn't been enacted, unless you've suddenly brought in a ministerial order, but when we last checked. So the only other thing you're pointing to is the two-year lease. Minister, will you please acknowledge that rents are going to go up 10% this year, so it hasn't worked. The two-year lease just doubled the increase that landlords um, Deputy, imposed. Deputy, uh, could you give yeah. the minister, because there are other colleagues as well. And just on, on the Tyrrellstown situation, and the, the minister mentioned it, um, and I, I, thanks for, for agreeing to meet them, but 
I, I would ask you to ask local authorities to enact something that, where pe people are in homes already and if the council does acquire them, the council can't start evicting the people who are in those houses. There has to be a new scheme developed to allow people to purchase those houses, which they're well able to do because the rent that they're paying is twice what they pay in a mortgage anyway. So, um, the minister an opportunity because I have several others. Okay, can I just ask one last one? Very um, briefly. Like it's just about the, the, the investment strike of capital that's going on among private developers. Um, the CEO of NAMA referred to developers not being happy with a profit of 20 to 40,000 on a house that they might build in Dublin. So, Minister, relying on the private sector to resolve the housing crisis, it's simply not going to work. Um, and you've said that yourself, that they're hoarding land. So would you not accept that the role of the, the government has to be much, much, much larger?